All right. Um, so anyway, I've, I've been, what is all of this? Uh, I've noticed a trend in a lot of meetups that are centered around technologies where over time, as the technology kind of goes, rides that first wave, uh, which Ruby's first wave was a while ago, <laughs> where there becomes a, a segmentation or maybe a, a distance between the people who've been around the block with it and used it in a production environment, have you know felt out all the parts of it that hurt and you know kind of have moved beyond the part where they can even empathize sometimes with people who are new to the community and are just trying to get started. And so it's kind of a separation of those that know and those that don't. And um, what I see in, in a lot of meetups is that there's some old hats that come regularly and want to swap war stories and want to talk about the the crazy stuff that's going on with their client or in their in their product or you know something like that. And then there's new people to the technology who are really interested and excited and they're ready to build something for the first time. And sometimes it's difficult as a meetup organizer to figure out how to facilitate the meetup to serve both crowds. <clears throat> crowds. The content is either really advanced and it really scratches the itch of the people who are like used to using the technology in production and know what that's all about. And it goes way over the head of the people who are just there for the first time. Or the content is too beginner level and the experienced crowd loses interest and they don't really, you know, that, that doesn't scratch their itch. Um, and so what I found is that there seems to be a balance that needs to be struck. And there's actually a huge opportunity uh, if we can take advantage of that. There's people who've been around the block who can share what we know. I mean, I've been doing Rails for a while uh, in production and I know a lot of things about it, but I always, I always learn something new from somebody who's new to it. Um, just this past week, I learned how easy it actually is to get up and running with browser tests in Rails now. Like there is no configuration, it's just Rails new and your, your browser works. Um, I didn't know that, that's since Rails 5. Um, there's, so th there's like a, there's a give and a take there of, we have a lot of information that we can share to the community and people who are new to the community have a lot to learn, but they bring this excitement and this joy and, you know, I don't know, there's just an energy with people who are, are learning a technology for the first time that is easy to lose after you use it for a while and you start to get um, jaded a little bit about it and you start to see only the warts and you don't see the excitement and the productivity that came the first time that you used it. So you, you start to take that for granted. And so kind of putting those pieces together, um, I, I guess I'll say the next six months of the Cincinnati Ruby Brigade is going to be unabashedly focused at the new to Ruby crowd. And the idea is we're gonna cover some new to Rails level topics. We're gonna to plan to make a lot of mistakes, not like actually plan the mistakes themselves, but we're gonna to plan to make a lot of mistakes and have fun doing it. Um, and not worry too much about the quality of the things that we're making, not worry about the craftsmanship quite yet, but really try to tap into the excitement and the energy that comes from doing things for the first time. And so we're gonna follow for this series, we're gonna follow a no judgment rule. So if the code works and eventually when we get there, when the tests pass, we're just gonna roll with it. Uh, there's definitely better and worse ways to do things and solve problems, but we're gonna leave like the pedanticism and the nitpicking and all of that stuff at the door and we're just gonna have as much fun as we can. Um, so when you have an opportunity, if you're, if you're new to Rails especially, when you have an opportunity to show off something that you've done, either by posting it up to GitHub or you know, sharing it here on the call, um, we're gonna celebrate that. We'll only give you critical, we're gonna try, and I'm gonna ask at the end of this statement if, if people can abide by it, but we're going to try to only give critical feedback if we've asked first or if it's been asked of us. And so the idea here isn't to write perfect code. It's to help people to come into a community that is written, like the community is based around a language that was written for developer happiness. And if we lose sight of that developer happiness, then Ruby loses a lot of the appeal that, that draws people into it. So that's kind of the idea. Now, if you are experienced at Rails, do you think that that is a rule that we can follow? <laughs> I see some head nods, yes, and some thumbs up. <laughs> cool, all right. Well, I will attempt to facilitate that and follow it myself. And if, uh, if we start getting off course and you feel like you know, the, the criticism of code is, is ramping up or you know, that we're being overly critical, then 
you know, we'll call attention to it and, and we'll, we'll try to address it. But the idea here is that you should feel 100% comfortable sharing anything that you've got, even if it just doesn't even run. Uh, the idea here is that we're going to try to help people uh, grow into a role where they know what they're doing with Rails, but recognizing fully that not everybody jumps right in as an expert. Nobody does. Okay. So why the series now? Like, why are we doing it now? Um, I, I think I said a, a minute ago, I've been thinking about this for about eight months and I've had that, those experiences of, you know, you go into the meetup and you have this time honored tradition of let's go around the room and everybody say your name and something about yourself and everybody shares a little bit about themselves. And it's so exciting that inevitably there's at least one or two people at every meetup that say, this is my first time here and I'm really excited to learn or I just graduated a code school nearby and I've been encouraged to attend meetups and this one seemed interesting. Or I've been teaching myself to code in the evenings and I just wanted to see what the meetup was like and see what kind of people are working in this, in this technology. And it's really exciting to meet people in that place. Uh, I think what troubles me is how often, at least in, the, in my own experience and especially in the meetups that I facilitated, how quickly those people fade away from the meetup. They come, they're very excited for one or two of them, and the content either doesn't match what they're looking for, or you know, there's gonna always be a little bit of fall off, but um, I'm always a little bit disappointed to see that excitement fade or those people disappear, and I don't like that. Um, I want to change that about this meetup. Uh, I think that oftentimes the people who share those stories often come from diverse backgrounds and uh, sometimes are underrepresented in the tech community. And when we fall short of creating the kind of community that welcomes people from who, who are different than the rest of the people already in the community, then we risk creating this echo chamber uh, and losing out on the richness of the community, what, what it could be. And so I'm, I'm kind of excited about that as sort of the next six months of a, of a push for us to be uh, thinking about how to include more people in the, in the Ruby community, because it really is a cool place. Um, I have, I have, Fun every day that I work in Ruby. Sometimes I hit my head against the wall and I bang my fist on the on the desk and I just try to like make something work and it just won't. But there's always little spots of happiness, and um, I want to be able to to introduce people to that and also you know help the whole community feed off of the energy of, of new people coming to it. And I've also seen an uptick in people being interested in Ruby, um, and so that that's kind of a thing that I want to be able to dovetail together with this meetup. So does everything I said make sense? Is there any questions about that? Um, you know, I, I want to I give an opportunity for this to be an interactive thing. I know this is a bit of a monologue at the beginning. Uh, I don't intend for the rest of the six months to be like this, but uh, I do want to kind of give a little bit of a rationale for why we're doing this. I see some thumbs up. Anybody have any comments or questions about it? So will, will this be once a month then or? Uh, that's that's a good question. I think once a month has been the cadence of the meetup. I, I do think for the pace of uh, at which if you're learning Rails for the first time, once a month is pretty slow. And so I was thinking about, uh, well, I'll send out a, a survey at the end of this and kind of gauge some interest, but uh, I, I was thinking about doing some labs in between. So there's going to be some assumptions that I make at the beginning of this. And Going forward, I think every meetup topic, we will start from the same basis, which is you're on a computer that can run Rails new and has some level of dependencies for the database or, or whatever it is. And so um, we need to get to the point where we can support everybody getting there. And I know there's things involved like Git and there's things involved eventually like Heroku um, to push your stuff out there so that other people can see the code and can see the application running. So there's some pieces to that that I think I can't necessarily expect for us to cover in a meetup format, um, but would probably be better served in a lab format where we could just get on a Zoom and people could play and struggle and have some, somebody there with them that, that can support them and kind of do more one-on-one -on -one stuff. So that was kind of the idea, is what we'll cover a topic once a month that's basically a Rails facet, something that's new, um, but have some time in between for people to be able to join up to a Zoom and, and just kind of play around and, and struggle with it and, and get some support. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. Um, so the Discord server is probably the primary place of support. Like if you're working on your own time, uh, if you have a question, just drop a question in there and we will try to support you as much as we can. I'll have some other resources along the way that we can point you at other people in the community. Other There's a Slack channel for the Cincy Tech um, that you can join. There's a Ruby channel there. 
But for the most part, I, I want to be able to have one point of contact. And so I wanted to make that the Discord server. And we'll send stuff out through Meetup and all the other things. But um, if you need more of like a a one-on-one -on -one experience where you can ask a question and get an answer from somebody, I'd like that to be the Discord server. So we'll create channels as needed for the different topics and, and kind of talk through that stuff. All right, um, so the, some of the rationale for that whole like lab idea came from um, Super Chris Nelson, who ran for a while and, and probably will start up at some point again. He ran something called the Aspiring Web Developers Meetup. And uh, I saw a spark there that caught fire that was really cool. And it's just a group of developers willing to sit and learn and help each other in a supportive environment. By the end of the, the sessions, it was usually people who were new to development who were actually helping each other and not the mentors that were volunteering to show up. And that was pretty cool. Um, so the monthly meetup, this part is the most visible. This is where we'll discuss topics and touch the surface of, of new things, but recognizing that everybody's going to start from somewhere different and probably have different needs. I want to be able to adapt to that and be, um, I, I want this to be essentially like a reactive group, like a group that, that can see the need and fill it rather than prescribing some course of action and telling everybody that you need to follow it because that's not really that's not really what we're trying to go for here and it doesn't really work if everybody's starting from somewhere different. So that's kind of the idea is that we'll have something that does start from Rails New as a presentation, but you could be so far from Rails New that you just need you know a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one time with somebody to help get an environment set up or even get a computer. And if you're at that place, then, then we'll try to figure out a way to, to support you to get to the point where the next meetup, you'll be able to start where everybody else is starting from. Um, and I will say again, like I've noticed from some feedback that this time slot seems to be a little bit tough for people to make. It's also pretty short, like a pretty compressed one. I expected for us to start um, the, the presentation part of this at, at about 1230. And that gives me about 30 minutes to do what I think is a lot of work and we'll see. But um, I, I will send out a survey at the end of this and I want to make sure that everybody who has an opportunity to say something on that survey and give us some feedback can so that we can get this thing set up in the right time slot for the most people who can join. But we are recording it and we'll, we'll put it online as well. Cool. So the outcomes that we're looking for here are people who are new to Ruby feel welcomed and supported. People who are experienced at Ruby have an opportunity to share knowledge with people behind you on the journey so that you can get some fulfillment from that, but also you know, you get a little bit of that energy and excitement that, that kind of comes on to you from, from interacting with people who are new to it. And we change the world, which is a little bit of a joke. I had nod to uh, Jeff Patton, who wrote a book called User Story Mapping. And there's an introduction in that book where he basically describes software development um, and, and its nuanced entirety almost in a way that we almost made it and have made it required reading for client projects in the past. Um, it's just very good. And in it, he says, we don't write software because it needs to be written, right? We don't write software just to, to make features. We write software ultimately because we want to change the world in some way. Even if it's small, even if it's for one person, we still want what we do to be, to be felt by somebody and for them to be able to have a better experience in life as a result of it. And so that's kind of one of the outcomes we're looking for is as we introduce more people and more perspectives into the Ruby community, uh, we want to change the world a little bit with it. So that's that's kind of the whole spiel. I'm kind of done monologuing. So <laughs> uh, I'll give one more opportunity. Does anybody have any questions or comments or you want to want to talk through any of that? Cool. All right. So uh, I have recorded a I have recorded a screen recording with no audio because I just did it this morning frantically and my computer crashed in the middle of it. So I just did what I could. Um, and I will post that up to YouTube and send a link out, but it's basically taking uh, an Ubuntu machine from fresh, clean, vanilla install to being able to run Rails new. Um, and that's kind of the point at which we'll start all this. If it actually helps, we might be able to just ship a VM to everybody who wants one and you could start from there. But I'm kind of just assuming a free operating system and the basics of, you know, the most popular one uh, flavor of that. So. Uh, as we go forward, if you have a different setup or something and you have questions, we'll totally support you. Just ask questions in Discord. Um, but as you're, as you're working on things for the first time, maybe, it, maybe it'd be a good time to actually do the, the time-honored tradition and kind of see where people are coming from. Um, I, I won't put everybody on the spot, but if you're interested in sharing 
where you are in the journey and what your name is. Uh, that might be enough to say who you are and um, what you're hoping to get out of or contribute to this. And I don't, I mean, I, everybody has a different list and a different order, so anybody jump in. <laughs> um, I'm Drew Zugelter. Uh, oh, go ahead. I don't know. It's all good. Go for it. All right. I'm Joe Zugelter. I, um, I just graduated from Tech Elevator back in April doing the .NET stuff. Um, I am working there now actually as an academic fellow. So they hired me to help teach a bunch of Chase students Java. So I'm, you know, learning Java two weeks ahead of the students I'm teaching Java to. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, I'm really a teaching assistant. So I'm not, you know, I'm there to hold hands and walk people back from the ledge. Um, but I, you know, I'm going to try to make it to all of these that I can. I might have to duck out a little early here and there. Um, but uh, I'd like to learn Rails. It seems like a really neat way to do, you know, I haven't used Rails ever. I've, I've heard of it and I've been hearing about it for, I think, coming on 18 years now or something. I don't know when, uh, how old Rails is, but I had a roommate who was really into it in college and I just sort of shrugged and went back to, I was doing computer engineering, so I did my assembly language and I just said, well, that's silly, okay. So that's me. Hi, I'm Zach. Uh, I currently work for a, a 3D printing co company called Shapeways. Um, I've been there for uh, coming up on five and a half years. Um, but uh, I started building, uh, when I first started, I started building things in Python. Uh, I wanted to learn software development. Python was um, really easy to get into, and I, I, I love it. I love it still. I haven't built anything in a while. But I used Selenium um, back in the day uh, to automate some some things, and uh, then moved on to JavaScript. Um, was fascinated with React, still fascinated with it. Um, I kind of broke the system almost and learned React before knowing all of uh, HTML, CSS, all that JavaScript. So actually I took a JavaScript course after learning React and learned the fundamentals. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just I've, I've kind of went about it in a weird asynchronous way, but uh, I want to be better at like learning new technologies and uh, frameworks and um, languages um, just to be more versed at it. Cool. Hey, Zach, I'm like the opposite of you. I'm an old guy, uh, did Rails from the beginning, and I stayed kind of on the server side and stayed away from the client side. So I'm here because uh, Tim, uh, you know, as Tim said, um, when when you're teaching, you learn so much also. And, and I just don't teach enough, and, and I'd love to teach more because I get so much out of it. I For three years, I volunteered at uh, Little Miami High School teaching web development to high school students. And uh, one of the most rewarding um, things in my life truly has been one of those guys went on and started a career in software development and is a web developer for one of our competitors. I don't mind that. Um, but, you know, he's a great guy. They're a great company, Differential. I'll give him a shout out. They're good folks. Um, and uh, he loves his job. And he, he would have found it anyway if I hadn't helped him. But it's just one of those little things. You get so much out of teaching and I, I encourage anyone that's new here and new to Rails or new to development, um, just speak up because you're gonna help us both. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to do something awesome. So I'm also uh, one of the founders of Gaslight, um, but uh, very happy to be here. Thank you, Tim, for organizing and uh, looking forward to doing this as frequently as I can. So thanks everyone. Patrick and Chandra, I think you guys have to drop soon. You, yeah. you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name's Patrick Duffy. Uh, I work for Coupa. Um, we, Chandra and I both work for Acquire, which we were bought out. Um, we were a Java shop. Uh, Coupa is a big Rails company. Um, um, so for the last two years, we've been um, working both within both Java and uh, Ruby. Uh, Chandru especially has been working on mainly in uh, uh, Ruby. Um, I've been developing for close to 25 years, uh, written 
everything from assembly to to Ruby, <laughs> to React, you name it. We 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 I've done it all. So um, I'm nowhere close to being an expert in, in Rails, but uh, proficient, I guess. Chandru, you wanna? Yeah. Um, hi everyone, uh, and thanks, Tim, for setting up this uh, meetup. Um, myself, Chandru Shekhar. Um, uh, I basically like started my career with Java and been working in Java for almost like, uh, 13 years. So once, like Patrick told, uh, after we got acquired by Cooper, uh, I got an opportunity to learn and start working on Ruby, which excited me. Um, uh, I don't say like I I didn't do any kind of formal course or started learning Ruby and Rails, but uh, it's all uh, started working on based on like when and when uh, we wanted to get the work done. Um, so I'm very much interested to learn Ruby on Rails. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to learn uh, something from this. Yeah. Thanks. And, and we have to drop, but thanks Tim for inviting us. Yeah. We'll, we'll be sure. at the next one. Sure. 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 I'll, do, I'll send out a link on YouTube for the rest of today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Sure. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I've been, I'm a career switcher, so I've been programming for about four years. Um, I had a previous life in, uh, in biology and uh, I work for Teespring. I've been there for about two years now and I, I'm primarily a Python developer, um, mostly Django and Flask, but um, a lot of our infrastructure is Ruby. And so I've been sort of hobbling along trying to like eh, kind of figure it out, but I really don't understand it well. So I was really excited when I saw this, um, this meetup get set up because I, I think I will learn better with some structure and especially since I'm trying to do this around my day job, um, hopefully it'll just help me be more valuable to the team. So thank you very much. Um, my name's Zachary. I'm a current student at Tech Elevator. Um, I'm learning Java right now, and I've done some uh, JS, uh, HTML, and CSS, but I wouldn't say I'm a professional programmer <laughs> at all. But uh, <laughs> um, I'm really looking forward to learning uh, Ruby. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. All right, anybody else? I'll give it 10 more seconds. And if nobody says anything, then move on. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Madhumati here. Um, uh, I mean, like, I'm on the QEA automation space, and I've been mostly working on Selenium Java, and uh, I, I just started with Ruby. So Rails will be pretty much new for me. And uh, thanks, Tim, and others for organizing this. And hi to everyone else. And hi. I'm in Columbus region. It's good to see you again. Um, you were on the Columbus Ruby Brigade meetup, right? Uh, yep, yep. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Anyone else? Uh, I'll go ahead and go. Um, I'm Kevin Muntz. I'm uh, out of Columbus. I did Ruby a million years ago. Back in the rails in one or two days, I was at a startup working out of the edge case office here. Uh, since then, I've been focused on mobile and kind of had my blinders on, but I've been missing Ruby and, and all my polyglot ways of, of the past. So trying to get back into it, brush off the, the skills. So just looking for ways to, to help me do that and glad to be uh, welcome here. Thanks. Yeah, Kevin, good to see you again. I remember you, you from uh, the uh, the old CRB days, the Columbus Ruby Brigade. I used to go up there before we really got Cincinnati yep. kicked off. And uh, Joe and um, uh, Ken from Edge Case and, and that whole bunch. Um, so good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. I remember, yeah. <laughs> Did I understand CRB. correctly, Kevin, that you're the one that started the method of the month up there? 
I am. Yeah, it was sort of like how you were saying it. The talks, as as the core CRB members got more advanced, the talks got more advanced, and then, you know, I wasn't doing it every day at that point, but I wanted to speak more, so it was kind of my way to hit that. You know, lower the bar for participation, have some more beginner content, and get myself speaking. So, yeah, I did a dozen or so of those uh, back then. So maybe I'll maybe I'll start doing it again. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be cool. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? You are certainly not on the hook. I'm not trying to make awkward silence happen so you'll speak, but I do want to give everybody a chance to speak who wants to. All right, going once, going twice. Cool. So it is 12.36 and this will be fun. It'll be almost like a lightning round version of it. Um, one of the things that if I'm the presenter, in any given month. Um, I'm kind of following a little bit of a lead of some other people that I've seen do this, but I'm not planning to be particularly polished. Um, and in fact, sometimes I will only run through the, the high level overview of what I want to accomplish in the talk first and not actually go through all the scripted details of everything. And that'll probably get us stuck every once in a while. And I want to kind of be vulnerable here and just as I get stuck, everybody else can realize, excuse me, realize that when you get stuck, it's normal. <laughs> that every developer ends up on Stack Overflow at some point in their lives. Um, and one of the ways that we bust through that at Gaslight is by doing pair programming. And so if I get stuck, it's likely that Alex, if she's pairing with me, is not stuck and she knows exactly what's going on. And maybe I just haven't given her a chance to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to probably type some things into the computer today. It's not going to work at some point. And then hopefully if everything goes according to some kind of a loose plan, it will eventually work. Um, but even if not, even if we don't get all the way through everything, um, some of this is just giving you some reassurance that even if you've been developing for 16 years in my case, um, you don't know everything and it doesn't even matter if you do because your fingers can't type everything accurately every time. And so we forget things that we've already learned. And so kind of going back to the drawing board is an opportunity for me to actually relearn some of the things that I've just taken for granted for a while. <clears throat> so what I want to do for this very first one is a little bit different. The rest of them from here is going to be just Rails new and then we're going to work on Active Record or Rails new and we're going to work on um, something, you know, active, active job, or we're going to send an email, something that's productive and helpful with Rails. Uh, and we're going to do the, the shortest, straightest path to being able to get something productive. Um, for this one, um, there, there's a little bit of value uh, in knowing that everybody's sort of at the same place and that you can share what you're doing with other people around you. And so what I want to do is basically just run Rails new, get ourselves like a stock Rails vanilla application get it up onto a GitHub account. And if there's time, which there probably won't be at this time at this point, but if there is time, get it up on Heroku so that you can share your code with somebody and share your running application with somebody. And, you know, from there you can, you can be proud of what you've done and, and show it off to your friends. Or if you're stuck, you can share it with one of us or, you know, somebody who's advanced in rails or, or a little bit further along than you actually, uh, and they can help you with it as well. So some of this will probably be a little bit more intermediate than what you want. Um, but if not, then great. And if it is, well, you know, we're trying to get everybody up to where you are then. So you can help people that are a step behind you then. Does that sound okay? All right. I'm going to try to do this all the way from basically scratch. Uh, so we'll see. But I'm going to create a new GitHub account and create all the keys and everything that you need in order to push code up. And so uh, if things break down at any point and I get stuck and you see that I'm stuck, feel free to jump in and give me any kind of hints or, or help that you feel is appropriate. I will not be embarrassed or any more shamed than I already am. <laughs> okay, uh, actually I wanted to just share a smaller part of the screen so that it's a little bit bigger for everybody to see. Okay, can everybody see a VirtualBox VM that says Timothy Mecklem in the middle of it? Yes. Okay, great. Here's my password, a bunch of dots. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so what I have is basically a brand new fresh Ubuntu installation with some prerequisites installed. I'll send the video, like I said before, of how to get to this point, um, but we really don't have time to go through all the compiling of the Ruby version and everything, or we would just be here until two or three in the afternoon. And I wanna be respectful. So we're gonna to try to end exactly at one and get as far as we possibly can. So in order to share your code with somebody else, you're gonna want it up on GitHub or something similar. We're gonna use GitHub just because it's one of the more, one of the easier ways to do it and everybody knows or has at least heard of GitHub. So if you've already got an account, great. If you've already got your SSH keys, which I'll cover in a minute, great. Uh, if this is old hat to you, that's fine. Uh, we're gonna go through it as though everybody has never done this before. Okay, so I am going to start just by creating a new Rails application. Um, I have installed Ruby and that's about as far as I've gotten. I have, I have Node.js and I have Ruby. And so I wanna be able to make sure that I can run a Rails application. So what I'm gonna do first, um, the one thing that I didn't actually do in the video that I'll just do here for the sake of everybody having some continuity is I forgot to install something called lib SQLite dev or SQLite 3 dev. And what this is, is it's a database library that's the default testing library for, for uh, Rails. And you need this in order to run Rails new. Otherwise it won't, um, it won't compile. So I will go ahead and do that first. And if you have any questions or anything along the way, jump right in. Um, this is an interactive presentation and it's a live code and there's always gonna be stuff that comes up. So if you have any questions or I'm jumping too far ahead or too far, too slow, just let me know. All right, so I have installed and it was already installed because I did it earlier today, the lib SQLite 3 dev. And then the next step that you wanna do is install is something called, go ahead. Uh, excuse me, Tim, is there any way we can Increase the font size. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I have to figure out how to do that because I don't usually work in Ubuntu, but I will. Does anybody know off the top of your head how to increase the font? Oh, it's Control okay. Plus. Oh, I there. found it. It is Control Shift Plus, apparently. Ah, shift. Control, well, it's Control Shift and then the plus equals key. So, okay, cool. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and gem install Bundler now. Uh, Bundler is a package manager for rails or for ruby um it's going to be something like npm for node it'll be like uh pip i think is that right for python and so just kind of giving you some frame of reference if you're used to some other frameworks or languages it's going to be the thing that manages the versions of all the dependencies that we have in our applications okay so bundler is installed and the next step is i need to install rails so i'll do that I think it's already been installed, otherwise this could take a little while. Okay, so what you'll see is probably a lot more stuff happen on your screen, but at the end of it, you should come up with um, successfully installed all the gems that it was needed. And then the ne very next step is Rails New. And so I'll just kick that off. So we're gonna do Rails New, hello, since ERB. It takes a lot of flags. I'm gonna ignore all the flags until we get to things that actually matter. Um, we might actually have to do it without JavaScript because I don't think I have Yarn installed, but we'll see. We'll see what happens when I run real server. Oops. Okay, so once it's done, you're still in the folder where you ran the Rails new, but you need to go into the folder where your application is. So it creates a folder called the same thing that you called Rails new. And then we'll see if this works. If not, I might have to start over. Okay. Yeah, let's go back a folder and I'm going to delete the hello since ERB. And we'll try this again. So I'm gonna do Rails new, but this time I'm gonna say, you know what, skip JavaScript. We'll get to that later. <laughs> Sorry, Zach, I know that React is a, is a fun thing for you. <laughs> That's all right, I moved past. <laughs> now okay. I'm spelt. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, everything is run basically the same way that it was. We just skipped the JavaScript part and now we'll go into there and run Rails S and see what happens. All right, so you'll see some stuff. It says booting Puma. Puma is the default um, a rack server for running rack applications like Rails and Rails uses it by default. 
And also by default, when you're running a Rails server in development mode, it listens on port 3000. So if we open up a web browser and we go to localhost 3000, we should see a very welcoming message. <laughs> Yay, you're on Rails. Great. Um, so from here, this is essentially the springboard point from which all of the different talks that we're going to talk about for the next six months are going to come off of. Um, but I don't really want to do anything else inside of Rails for today. Uh, we got about 15 minutes left. So what I want to do is create a GitHub repository and push to that from where I'm at so that I can share this code with you and then you can share your code with me and we'll all be able to help each other when we get stuck. Does that sound okay? So in order to do that, I will, I created another test account, so let me sign out of that one. In order to do that, uh, if you don't have a GitHub account, I'm gonna just kind of assume that this is your first time encountering GitHub. And so I will create a tmeclum since ERB account and use an email address that's kind of like that. And I'll give it a password. And then I get to solve a really fun puzzle. I get to rotate this animal to be the right orientation. <laughs> I think I got it. We'll find out. Oh, last time was about four seconds. <laughs> uh, oh, my password's not good. That's good because it was entirely guessable and you probably would have guessed it. OK, I've created the account. I don't need to save it. And then I end up in this screen that's like, hey, welcome, tell me about yourself. I'll go to the home page, and I've hit a wall. I have to verify my email address, just like most websites now. So I will grab that link off screen and verify it. How would you relate Rails to, like, a, is it like, would you say it's closer to, like, uh, Flask or um, Django? That is a good question. I am not a good, I, I'm, not, I'm not the right person to answer that question, but I'm sure there's somebody here who is. Bill, do you know the answer to that one? No, I'm, I was an old PHP guy. Sarah said she did. Python. Yeah, um, I, he I heard the words Flask and Django, but I missed the first part of the question. So if you could repeat it, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, how does Rails compare to those, those two? I would say it probably compares more to, um, to Django in that Rails is pretty full featured and there, there seems to be a lot of stuff that happens automatically. Um, Flask is a lot more stripped down and is kind of a um, a, a bare bones um, sort of framework that you you kind of have to manually add in all the things that you need. Um, what's great about it is it's super lightweight, um, so there's not a lot of uh, extra stuff that comes along with it. But if you aren't sure what you need, it can be a challenge, especially for beginners. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. In interesting. Flash sounds like uh, Sinatra. Sinatra is the v extraordinarily lightweight um, web uh, framework for Ruby. So yeah, it's interesting. I, I'll look at Flask. Yeah. Yeah, I, ha I have not worked with um, Sinatra before, but for um, we've actually started using Flask for some of our, our smaller applications um, at Teespring, and it's worked out super well. It's very performant. It's easy to scale. It's just... Um, it's a, it's a great little framework. It's just that you kind of have to, it's a little bit tricky here and there. Interesting. All right. We're sorry, uh, Tim, I've taken us down a rabbit hole. Oh, no worries. Bring at us all. back. Okay. So I'm going to, so I verified my email and this is the, the screen that you get to on GitHub when you have never done anything on GitHub before. Um, it has a create your first project with a little green create repository button. And we're going to click that. And so it gives you a form basically to, to fill out to give your project a home. 
And we call this hello underscore since the RB. And so I'm going to make the repository name the same thing just for the sake of clarity. And that's generally a good practice if you can do it. Um, you can choose to make it, to give it a description. You can make it public or private. You used to have to make it public if you didn't pay them. <laughs> um, and we don't need to do any of the initialization of anything because what we're going to do is actually push up an existing code base to it. And this kind of gets a little messy when you do that. So we'll just leave it at the defaults and just give it the repository name and click create repository. And then it gives you this wall of things that you can run. And so there's a quick setup. There's a create a new repository on the command line. We're not going to do either of those. We're going to push an existing repository from the command line. And so in order to make this work, there's a couple of things that need to be in place. First, it needs to be a Git project. And so we're going to git init the current folder. And so what that's going to do is create all the pieces that are needed in order for Git to be initialized here. And well, I guess it was already there. I guess Rails does that for you. I always forget between the different frameworks what it, whether it does or not. But um, if I run git status, I'll see a whole bunch of files that are not checked in. And so does I'm Rails, going to go ahead. Sorry, does Rails install Git if it's not already installed? Uh, I I'm not sure because in the in the setup video for the prerequisites, it basically I'm I'm walking you through setting it up through ASDF, which is a version manager of all these like of Ruby or of Node.js or of Python or you know you can use it for basically anything, including databases, which is a little bit weird. But um, so I you have to install Git in order for that part to work. So I'm not actually sure, but you'll have if you follow that video, you'll have Git before you get this far anyway. Gotcha. Okay. So. What I'm going to do is just add everything that's here in the vanilla file or the vanilla Rails new into the Git repository. And the way to do that, well, one of the ways to do that that's fairly straightforward is to run git add with the current directory at the root of where you're at. So I'm in hello since CRB. Git add dot just basically says add all of the files that are in this project. And so you'll see when I run git status the second time, I don't see a bunch of red. I see a whole bunch of green that means that it's staged, it's ready to be committed and pushed up. And so the next step after you've added things is to run git commit, give it a message. Um, so here is just a preference thing, but what I usually do is I write exactly the command that I did when I created the Rails, because a lot of times I'll pass a bunch of flags in and I won't remember exactly what those were. So in this case, I'll do exactly the command that I ran. And I'm hit with this, uh oh, you don't, I don't know who you are. So I can't really auto detect, I can't commit. Um, so all we really have to do here, which is fairly straightforward, is, uh, is just run, I guess, I'm trying to, I'm not used to using these, um, this terminal. So hopefully I can figure out how to paste, but I guess it doesn't matter. I'll type it up. Um, you just run these two commands with the right information in them. So my user dot email is is we'll call it Timothy eh, Timothy at Mecklen.com and then get config global the user dot name is going to just be Tim Mecklen. Okay. And that stores that off in a global configuration file for git. And now I can rerun the commit. And so I'll get commit with a message of the command that I ran to create the get the Rails repo. And if I run git status again, I'll have no changes. There's nothing to commit. The working tree is clean. And if I look at the log files from the last four commits, there's only one, and it's the, it's the message that I just did. And so I've checked in basically the vanilla version of this project uh, on an initial commit to a repo. And you generally want to do this without making a whole lot of changes beyond that, because this is kind of like the first checkpoint to, okay, I got a new project, I'm ready to go, let's just commit it before I make a lot of changes. And then you can kind of see the transformation of what you've done to the project over time as you get more comfortable and start using Git more often. But I have a, I have a Git uh, commit. And so my repository locally is all ready to go. And I'm excited. I want to push this up and show the world my new project that I've made. In order to do that, uh, it looks like I've got 
Uh, let me show you a little bit of a different way. Uh, this is probably going to help later. You can switch between using their HTTPS interface, which uses just a web-based push, and their SSH, which uses a little bit different. And so I'm going to switch over to that and use the SSH one. So there's just this toggle, um, and it changes all the commands that you run. So I'm going to grab that. And now I really do need to figure out how to copy and paste. Copying is easy, I suppose. The pasting, maybe not so much. There we go. OK. Uh, I'm going to run this, and I fully expect it to fail the next command, not this one. So what I've done with this is I've added an, a remote repository. So I have my local one that's on the box that I'm on. So right here, I have a Git repository on this. But GitHub also has a repository, and I want to add it as a remote for the thing that I'm building so that I can push my local code up to the GitHub remote. And I'm calling that remote thing origin. And so every time that I interact with origin, it's going to be GitHub. So it'll push it up to GitHub. So what I've done is basically just linked my local repository with that repository on GitHub that I created. Now, it's going to say the next thing is to push. So it wants me to push the code that I have locally up to GitHub. And that is not going to work. It's going to say, hey, you've never connected to this before. This is an SSH message. I'll say, sure. And then I immediately get blocked. And it says, you don't have access to this thing. And the reason that this happens is that in order to communicate with GitHub over SSH, you need to be passing in the right information through an SSH key. So there's a public and private encryption key that you use to connect. And the way to do all of this is, is fairly straightforward, but it is a little bit tricky the first time that you encounter it. So I'm just going to run this command called SSH keygen. And it wants to generate a public-private RSA key pair. This is the thing that, that GitHub needs. And so if you don't have one of these, you can use the defaults. If you do have a file in that place, you probably don't want to replace it. So just as a heads up, if, if you've gone through these steps before, I, I wouldn't do it again. You can, you can reuse those keys. And if you have any question about that before you run it, just ask, and, and we can walk through that. And I'll show you how to look to see if that key exists already. But we'll go ahead and hit enter for the default on that. I'm just going to use no passphrase on this. So I hit enter twice. It gives us this pretty little ASCII art image. And then we have a public and a private key. Now, both of those files are important. And one of them is important, and you should never show it to anybody. And the other one is important, and you should show, share it with everybody that needs to be able to talk to you. And so inside of your home folders.ssh folder, you should have two files, one called id underscore rsa and the other one called id rsa dot pub. Sorry, id underscore rsa dot pub. And, and the real trick here is you never want to share the private one, but the one that says pub for public, that's the one you want to share. And so if you cat that out, you can just grab all of it and copy it. And what you're going to do now is go over to GitHub and go over to your settings. And you'll get a whole menu of a whole bunch of stuff you can do. But there's a section here called SSH and GPG keys. And over in the SSH keys, you can see this button that says new SSH key. If you click it, paste what you copied from the command line there and give it a name. So this is going to be my Ubuntu VM key. Whatever you type there doesn't really matter a whole lot. It's just for you to reference it later. So you can click add SSH key. And you'll see that it added it there with a little fingerprint and says that I've never used it. So now, if we go back here and run that git push dash u origin master, now it actually let me do it. And the reason is because it's pushing that up encrypted and the, and the server can tell that I am who I, who I say I am. So I basically told GitHub, when, when you get a push that's from this key, then you should know that it's OK. All right, that's a lot of stuff, and we're at 1259. Are there any questions so far? It's OK if you have a question and it goes over. I can, uh, we'll wrap up, and then if you want to hang out for a few minutes afterward, we can do that. But I do want to be mindful of people's time. So right up on the very end of this, if I go back to my home again, now you'll see that under my repositories list is the one that I just created. and Ta-da, everything's here. So this is that first commit of the Rails application that I just pushed up and skipped all the JavaScript. And, and you know we, we committed into Git, told it what our email address was and everything, and then created the GitHub keys and pushed it up. 
So that's quite a bit of stuff to cover. Most of you have probably encountered this before, but if you haven't, it's totally cool. And I know this is a really weird, bizarre thing to have to go through to push code somewhere. So um, with that, I think we'll we'll just take questions. And if you need to drop off and get back to work, you can, and we'll just put, post the recording up after it. So thank you for joining if you need to drop. Um, and if you don't need to drop and you have questions, hang out and we'll talk. Uh, so Tim, uh, do we have to create um, SSH? Key gen for uh, our individual repositories, or if we create it once, we can use it for all the repositories which we create. Yeah, if you create it once, you can use it for all your repositories. Um, that that is your identity to GitHub on the machine that you're on, and so you'll have potentially multiple keys if you work from different computers. But you generally only have one or two keys that you upload, and it doesn't matter which repository you're pushing from. Okay, thank you. Yep, you also can use the HTTPS interface. There's just some it's just a little bit gnarly at different points. And so if you if you want to try that first, you can try that. Um, there is a way to convert over to SSH if you run into any of those hiccups and you want to change over. So that's a possibility in case that's an easier solution. You just have to type your actual GitHub password a lot. And that makes me a little bit uneasy. <laughs> Does it work through uh, two-factor authentication? Uh, Okay, so if I remember right, yes, I think that it actually opens up a browser now, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I can't really remember. I know that Heroku totally does fine. that now. So when you do Heroku login um, on the command line, it brings up a browser and you click through their login process and then you go back to the terminal with some kind of like gotcha. a key. So I, I can't remember exactly whether GitHub does that or not, but probably yeah. not, probably and I don't I, know. <laughs> Well, I think it's OS and app specific also. So, you know, your mileage may vary um, switching between Linux and Mac and Windows. So, um, In regards to the operating system, do we need to have a um, Ubuntu terminal in order to use Rails or can we just use a stock terminal on Mac? Uh, oh yeah, if you're on a Mac, um, it's, it's generally okay just to use the stock terminal. ASDF works the same way there. If you're working on a Windows machine, you have a couple of different options. So I'm not sure exactly how to give advice on that. Um, they have something called the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, they're up to WSL2. And that's a really fantastic way because it kind of integrates with Windows pretty well. You can also just do an Ubuntu VM. I kind of defaulted to the VM because everybody could kind of everybody should be able to get VirtualBox locally and run an Ubuntu VM and we can kind of walk through what that looks like. Um, but I do Windows development with Ruby and I've supported a team doing that. And so uh, there's there's quite a few options. It's just kind of a preference thing. So if you're in that situation where you're on a Windows machine and you want to know how to do the, how to set it up the easiest, um, we'll probably have a couple questions and a conversation about it, but can definitely get you there. Okay, and then um, you're going to post the um, video on how to install Ruby and stuff on Discord, I imagine? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll link to it from Discord. There's a uh, Cincinnati Ruby Brigade. Um, it, I think there's like a sub header underneath the, the Gaslight one, but, but I'll put it up on YouTube and link to it from the Discord. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. And a lot of this was very much sys admin system administration <laughs> work uh, unless Ruby works. So if you have any trouble at all, it is kind of OS dependent and like virtualized solutions like VirtualBox or whatever, those can be kind of taxing on your system depending upon, you know, RAM and uh, your uh, hard drive type and stuff like that and capacity. So if you have any issues at all, please hit us up on the Discord server. We'll jump in, we'll try to tailor you a solution um, for your individual needs. And then um, we'll just be mindful that some of the stuff, if you don't install it exactly as Tim has set up, that there may be little adjustments you'll have to make, but we'll work with you until those become kind of second nature and you don't notice them anymore. But Discord server is a great place to just reach out and ask for help. Yep. And if you're at a place where you can't do the Rails new part yet, um, and I post that prerequisites and you have any questions or you're, you're at a different place than where it starts from. Um, I'm, I'm kind of intending for us to, I'll do a poll and kind of figure out good times for people, but I'd like to be able to have a couple of like open office hour kind of things where you can join into a zoom 
and at least somebody will be there, like one person at least will be there who can help you with your specific setup to get to the point where you can run Rails new, because that's really the springboard for the rest of the talks. So this is all this this is all a precursor to being able to share what you've done and and be able to start from the same place every month and, and get somewhere really fun and useful. Yeah. And spread the word. Um, you know, if you've enjoyed it, if it's been a bit beneficial, tell your friends, tell anyone interested in, you know, getting started. Um, the more the merrier, definitely. Alex, what'd you got? Um, I was going to ask for clarification, where's our discord uh, information at? Is that on the meetup page? Uh, I haven't put it on the meetup page yet. Uh, I did post it in the Zoom chat here, and oh, uh, I'll post it in the the Cincy Tech Slack channel as well. Um, Sweet. Yeah, I'll, if you feel free to share that with anybody. Like, if if you have anybody who's remotely interested in Ruby, both remotely physically or remotely in the interest level, um, share it with them, and and we'll help. Um, this isn't this is Cincy RB, but mostly at the moment in name only because we're also remote. So uh, if there's somebody from Columbus or, or Cleveland and, you know, any, anywhere else uh, and they want to join up and, and kind of have another point of support, then feel free for sure. Invite them to the Discord server and we'll, we'll invite everyone. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? We didn't get to Heroku, which makes me a little bit sad, but I think that that was probably a deep enough dive for one day into getting everything moving with Rails. All right, well with that, then I guess we'll break uh, for this month, but I'll, I'll follow up with potential lab times and we might have a, a couple of opportunities in between now and next month um, and, and we can talk. And if you wanna hang out here for a few minutes and just chat, that's cool. But I'll stop recording so that you have an opportunity to do that without feeling like you're on TV. <laughs> <laughs>